OK, hi there, students. We have another essay for you. This one, the level, I think, is probably what I would expect for a master's degree in English literature, or maybe third year um, uh, for a bachelor's degree. OK, so anyway, let, let me, let me re read this to you. Um, it's uh, quite an essay. OK, so let's start. Firstly, here's the question. Write a commentary on this text. Include the following items. Text, text type and genre. Linguistic functions. Coherence. Theme, thesis and structure. Ideas and argument. Cohesion. Syntactic, semantic and literary features. Maximum a thousand words. OK, the essay is quite long, so I'm going to read the essay first. The text I've included at the end or also in the description, and I will read it when I actually finish read it, correcting the essay. So, essay by Asher, OK? The extract which is going to be examined with our literary magnifying glass is from Nathaniel Hawthorne's historical novel, The Scarlet Letter, 1850, an exquisite product of the Romantic period in American literature. OK, I, I, I really like this first sentence. I'm wondering, examined with, examined by, I think with is OK as well. In the text being analysed, the reader is introduced to Hester Payne, sorry, Hester Prynne, a name that deliberately rhymes with sin, Prynne Sin, who is the protagonist and the wearer of the titular, belonging in the title, Scarlet Letter. Since only an, expert fr an excerpt from this book is being subjected to critical analysis and not the book itself, let's promptly turn to this evocative, almost adoring delineation of a passionate woman whose illicit affair with a Puritan minister has now made her an object of shame and scorn. That's great. Yeah, I've got nothing to say, nothing to complain about th w this at all. The text is highly characteristic of a romance novel. I might put romantic, but romance is probably better. The term romance being used here in its wider literary sense of a narrative genre in, the, in literature that often tells a love story imbued with a certain dreaminess, a rapturous ethereality. Great sentence. Yeah, I was right about romance. Such dreaminess notwithstanding, a romance novel doesn't normally breach the realm of fantasy. Yes, I love these semicolons. The characters are flesh and blood and not incorporeal angels or elves. Nevertheless, the reader might be excused for mistaking this book for a high fantasy novel, especially as they read about the notorious emblem, fantastically embroidered and illuminated, upon her bosom. I love the way you, you, you're using um, uh, punctuation as well. The novelist goes on to say that it had the effect of a spell, taking her out of the ordinary relations with humanity and enclosing, spelling mistake, E-N, enclosing, my first mistake I found, enclosing her in a sphere by herself. The prose style is ornate but never per perperate or prolix. Good. The long, intricate sentences are reminiscent of Dick's, Dickens' elaborate but fluid constructions. Adjectives and other qualifiers abound. Colon. Therefore, you need a capital letter. Her smile is haughty. Her mani manner is delicate, evanescent and indescribable. 
and her hair is dark and her hair is dark and abundant hair, so glossy. Judging by this brief passage alone, Hawthorne is a master of prose style. Okay, yeah, I was thinking about the style of uh, of stylistic prose, but of uh, of um of prose style. Yeah, it works. It works as a noun noun collocation in this context. An adroit craftsman who possessed an architectonic sense of form, which is palpably displayed in the tight woven structure of the text. The story is told from an omnis 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 omniscient 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 yeah is told from an omniscient third person's perspective. A narrator who describes the interiority, I quite like this word, of the protagonist, as well as other characters from his unique vantage point. This is certainly not an objective and aloof observer who is only interested in a clinical analysis of the deportment of a brazen hussy before godly magistrate. I love it. Instead, we come across a sensitive, compassionate witness who cannot but be moved by the dignity with which Hester is bearing the misfortune. One wonders if he himself is astonished and even startled to perceive how her beauty shone out. This is particularly intriguing as Hawthorne is at times criticised for being a uh, a didact given to tedious pedantry rather than an entertaining literateur. So a literateur, somebody who uh, makes their business, their living from writing. Great word. Could it be that the narrator is being reduced to a mere nap mouthpiece for the novelist? On the other hand, it could be the case that since most of the characters are either reclusive or reserved, the narrator is aware that the onus is on him to report what they are like internally. This necessitates the narrator commenting directly on the characters. It's almost as if our attention is being called to the fact that we are not just witnessing the funereal, notice funereal, proceedings of a tyrannical court, but also actively engaging in a solemn excogitation, thinking about, of the deeper meaning of life itself. Hawthorne's use of symbolism is perhaps the most intriguing literary technique being employed in this text. The bright red colour of the letter A is symbolic of Hester's passion and the steadfastness of her resolve. The fact that the splendour of the scarlet emblem was greatly beyond what was allowed by the sumptuary regulations of the colony is indicative of Hester's impetuousness and her willingness to break the rules of propriety. To conclude, whether you read this as historical fiction or a romance that incorporates fantastic elements, you are bound to be struck by the writer's predilection for intricate sentences and his evocative, almost poetic imagery. That is a fantastic essay, Asher. Let's see, I'm an English teacher. This you could this um, is something I would expect from a, na from a native speaker, from a, 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 a native student of literature. Um, I, I, I am uh, bowled over by the quality of your English. Yeah, this, this is absolutely fantastic. It's a lovely essay. Um, I, I'm certain this, uh, this essay is going to get a good mark um, at the level of studying a master's degree. I'm 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 not uh, probably the right person to correct this at, the, at that level, but it reads beautifully. The cohesion is lovely. The 
um, analysis is really is really good. You've answered all of the b parts of the questions uh, as far as I I can see. Um, it's a really really good essay. Congratulations. I'm uh, bowled over by the quality. Well done. Okay, and then. I'm going to now read the text. OK, so it, the question was again, write a commentary on this te text. Include, so the text type and genre, very clearly answered. Linguistic functions, very good. OK, the di different things you've mentioned. The coherence, the way it's joined together. The theme, thesis and structure, ideas and arguments behind it and then the cohesion, syntactic, semantic and literary features of it. That's really good. So let me just read you the original text as well. When the young woman, the mother of this child, stood fully revealed before the crowd, it seemed to be her first impulse to clasp the infant closely to her bosom. Yeah, I like this semicolon, which, you, which Ash has used in many places. Not so much by an impulse of motherly affection, as that she might thereby conceal a certain token, which was wrought or fastened into her dress. Whoops. In a moment, however, wisely judging that one token of her shame would but poorly serve to hide another, she took the baby on her arm and, with a burning blush and yet a haughty smile and a glance that would not be abashed, looked around at her townspeople and neighbours. On the breast of her gown, in fine red cloth, surrounded with an elaborate embroidery and fantastic flourishes of gold thread, appeared the letter A. It was so artistically done, and with so much fertility and gorgeous luxuriance of fancy, that it had all the effect of a lasting and fitting decoration to the apparel which she wore, and which she was of, I'm sorry, and which was of a splendour in accordance with the taste of the age but greatly beyond what was allowed by the sumptuary regulations of the colony. The young woman was tall with a figure of perfect elegance on a large scale. She had dark and abundant hair, so glossy that it threw off the sunshine with a gleam, and a face which, besides being beautiful from regularity of feature and richness of complexion, had the impressiveness belonging to a marked brow and deep black eyes. She was ladylike too, after the manner of femi feminine gentility of those days, characterised by a certain state and dignity rather than the delicate, evanescent and describable grace which is now recognised as its indication. And never had Hester Prynne appeared more ladylike in the antique interpretation of the term than as she issued from the prison. Those who had before known her and had expected to behold her, dim, her dimmed and obscured by a disastrous cloud were astonished and even startled to perceive how her beauty shone out and made a halo of the misfortune and ignominy in which she was enveloped. It may be true that, to a sensitive observer, there was something exquisitely painful in it. Her attire, which indeed she had wrought for the occasion in prison, and had modelled much after her own fancy, seemed to express the attitude of her spirit. The, de the desperate recklessness of her mood, by its wild and picturesque peculiarity. But the point which drew all eyes, and, as if it were, transfigured the wearer, so that both men and women, who had been familiarly acquainted with Hester Prynne, were now impressed as if they beheld her for the first time. 
was that scarlet letter so fantastically embroidered and illuminated upon her bosom. It had the effect of a spell, taking her out of the, out of the ordinary relations with humanity and enclosing, ha, ah, I changed that for an E, but okay, enclosing, you're right and I'm wrong, enclosing her in a sphere by herself. Maybe it's an old spelling. She hath good skill at her needle, that's certain remarked one of the female spectators. But did ever a woman before this brazen hussy contrive in a way of showing it? Why, gossips, what is it but to laugh in the face of our godly magistrates and make a pride out of what they, worthy gentlemen, meant for a punishment? So I'm looking at this in closing Let's see, I think this is a very old-fashioned and very dated spelling. I would definitely spell it with an E, but I know that the original text is with an I. But then again, this was written in 1850, so English has changed quite a lot in that time. Yeah. Okay, so it's from the um, novel The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. OK, so well done, Asher. I think that's a really, really, really good piece of work. Well done. I'm really impressed with it.